We humans, we are a social species. Uh, you might think that other animals are social as well. Ants have division of labor, uh, you know, collaborate to look after the brood and protect the nest. Dolphins, when swinging a pod, will communicate with each other. Uh, meerkats will stand on the lookout, watch each other's back, and run grave danger for the colony. But we humans are the ultimate social species. Uh, most possibly because we had to kind of organize ourselves to run after food or to run away from things that thought that we were food. But over hundreds of thousands of years of sitting around the campfire, our brains evolved into social brains. And these social brains sometimes interact with things that they didn't evolve to be social with. Have you ever talked to a computer or muttered to your car? Now, I know I have. Uh, when I'm in a hurry and I'm taking a lift, I get in the lift and do I press the button once? No, I don't. I press the button several times and I press it just a bit harder because we all know that lifts come a bit faster if you press harder. Um, so we, we, we tend to just kind of put human-like qualities into things that are not human at all. Animals, but even dead things, such as machines. And we do so consciously. We do know that we talk to the cat and that the cat doesn't really understand us. But we do so unconsciously as well. In the 1940s, two psychologists, Hyder and Simmel, made little video clips using geometric shapes and magnets. And they moved them around and they invited people to describe what they were seeing. So let's have a look at this one. So there's a, there's a big triangle and he's a, he's a bit of a bully, isn't he? So he's picking on uh, the little triangle. Uh, there's also a circle there and uh, things are, are a bit tense at the moment, so kind of, oh my word, little triangle's being pinned against the wall. Uh, and little circle is concerned, so he's coming to have a look, but, but slightly afraid of what's going on. Oh my, you know, really tense moment now. Uh, <laughs> big triangle comes in the room and corners circle. Uh, what's going to happen? You know, circle doesn't know what's going on, he's getting really nervous. Uh, and luckily, he's got a friend there, little triangle to the rescue. And they lock big triangle in the room. They're really happy. There's a little celebration going on. But uh-oh, they're being chased again. And they make an escape. And that now really upsets big triangle. OK? <laughs> now, isn't that fascinating? Take, take a step back and think about what you've just seen. You've just seen geometric shapes on a screen, and you couldn't help but see human-like characters there. Um, and that's really interesting. Uh, we do it all the time. Pareidolia is another interesting uh, phenomenon. It's, it's where you see animal or human-like things that are kind of random patterns or objects. Let's, let's try one. So, when I show you this, you don't think, ah, oh, that sink needs a wipe. Your brain screams, there's a face. Yeah, so um, here's another one, uh, a scared building or uh, a zipper with attitude, the, the angry mop, of course, or a happy grater. And it's very easy to make those things. Yeah? So if I show you a screen with a dot on, that's just a screen with a dot on. If I Add another dot, it's two dots on a screen. And if I add a little swoosh, it suddenly becomes a friendly face. If I would have turned that swoosh upside down, your heart rate would have increased, and unconsciously, you would have been prepared to respond to that angry face staring at you from the screen. Um, now, let's turn our attention to robots. Here are some robots you might see at work today. Yes, uh, some robots assembling cars, on, uh, on a production line. Uh, here's a robot hoover cleaning around the house, uh, a drone filming from up in the sky. Uh, there's a search and rescue robot, which might be used in a, a military theater, uh, or the robots that uh, carry around little parcels in Amazon warehouses. Now, what do these robots have in common? Well, they actually have very limited awareness of people. They see people as obstacles. They don't know that people uh, you know, want to do things. They, they can't predict what people are going to do next. And the other way around is 
true as well. So we don't know what these robots are going to do. They're just kind of tin cans, and we don't really know what they think, what they're going to do next. And the reason why is because they don't engage with us on a social level. Yeah? And I don't know if you noticed, but all these robots, not a single, of, not a single one of them, had a face. And it turns out that making robot faces is actually quite easy. So why don't they have a face? If we want to make robot faces, um, we could just have a face on a computer screen and then put that computer screen on a robot and hey presto, we've got a simple robot with a face. Or we could go all the way and make Android faces, which then eerily look like humans. But making faces is easy. Uh, here's a keep on robot. Very simple. It's just like a squishy, uh, two yellow squishy balls on top of each other, two eyes and a nose, and immediately you've got a little face staring at you. Or here's an industrial robot that has two eyes, and it's got two arms, and we kind of instinctively know that it's going to do something with the right arm next, because it's staring at its right hand. Yeah, it's paying attention to its right hand. Here's another robot, which is a prototype for uh, the robot I've got here. So uh, this is a retro-projected face robot. And uh, when we kind of bring this thing to life, then this happens. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling, I'm happy again. I'm laughing a cloud so dark up above. The sun's in my heart, and I'm ready for love. Now, this robot, you know, the face is already kind of, you know, already draws you in. The moment we, we, we animate this face, and I, and I love the word animate, it's kind of, you know, bring a spirit into the robot. The moment it starts moving, it really draws you in. Your social brain responds strongly to this. Now, we know that, and this, you know, all these robots are very entertaining, but can you actually do something robot, uh, can you do something useful with a robot like this? And I think we can. Yeah, so, um, a while back, uh, my colleagues and me realized that robots are actually very special. They kind of are better than just computers. And the reason is that they're physically there. You can kind of physically touch a robot. Um, and to try this, or to, to kind of understand this a bit further, we took a robot into a school and had one half of the children play games with an actual robot, and the other half of the children play games with the same robot, but now displayed on a screen. The two robots did exactly the same, played the same game, set the same things, and what we noticed was that the children paid more attention to the real robot than to the robot on screen. Okay? Now, that's interesting. Can you think of an application that involves children and paying attention? Yeah, right, education. So um, what we did was we decided to build a robot teacher. Uh, we took the robot to a school again, and it was going to teach eight-year-olds about prime numbers. Now, this is a challenge. If you know eight-year-olds, you know that they don't handle prime numbers particularly well, or everything that, everything that feeds into it, multiplications, divisions. So we set ourselves a challenge of letting the robot teach them about prime numbers. Now, to compare this, we also uh, let children just interact with a computer screen that taught them the exact same lessons. And what we noticed that if the children play with a computer screen, they do learn. That's quite amazing. So they do learn about prime numbers. Well, actually, no, not really a surprising thing. But when they play with the robot, suddenly their performance jumps up 50%. Yeah. That's interesting, because it's exactly the same lessons that they're hearing. But the physical presence of the robot encourages them to do better. And then we thought, like, ah, oh, we're onto something. We're going to make the robot even better. We're going to make it really social. It's going to use their, their first name. It's going to be really friendly with them. And the performance dropped again. Turned out that when we made the robot too social, the children were not paying attention to the lessons anymore, but just kind of paying attention to, to, to the funny robot. Um, but we were onto something. Uh, robots seem to be able to make a difference there. And a while back, we were approached by a hospital in Milan, and they asked us if we could make a robotic alternative for their pet therapy program. 
They had been using pets quite successfully for years, so bringing cats and dogs into the ward and letting patients interact with the pets. But unfortunately, the pets are quite unhygienic. They carry allergens and pathogens, so not all patients could get access to the pet therapy. And they said, could you make a robot pet which we could just wipe down and pass from one patient to the other? Um, and we said, like, yeah, we could do that, but perhaps we can make something a little more challenging, a little more, more special. And we decided to build a robot friend. And that's kind of the vision that we had. So a little robot uh, and the children kind of huddling around the robot, having a conversation with the robot, and the robot being kind of a, you know, a pal for them during their stay in the hospital. And um, the, the medical team there asked us to focus, and we focused on diabetes. Um, so we focused on children of around the age of eight with diabetes. Um, now, the reason why we took diabetes is because diabetes is on the rise everywhere. So over the last 15 years, diabetes has doubled uh, in the UK. Same everywhere on the, everywhere on the planet, really. Um, it's, um, it's quite a big uh, impact that diabetes leaves. So there's no cure, but you can manage. But you'll need to monitor your diet really closely, your exercise. You need to kind of measure your blood sugar levels. You need about 1,500 injections of insulin a year. So it's quite intimidating for a young child to be diagnosed with diabetes. Um, it also puts quite a lot of strain on the healthcare system. And the medical staff in the hospital said, look, if you could build a robot that could help children understand their condition a bit better and manage their diabetes better, that would be a huge relief for us. So we set to work, and I'll show you a little clip of uh, the robot uh, in a Dutch hospital uh, working with children with diabetes. Here was for you best wel moeilijk om, om goed te letten op je bonus en goed te meten. Hoe gaat dat nu? Gaat steeds beter. Aankleden naar beneden, ja. prikken, bolussen. Bolussen, wat is dat? Bolussen. Jezelf insuline geven met een pompje. Pompen. In het ziekenhuis mm -hmm. hebben we een robot. Een robot. Charlie. Je gaat straks voor het eerst kennis maken met de robot. Dan kan je ook ontzettend goed helpen met je diabetes. Leuk, met de ontmoeten erop. Het is ook leuk om jou te ontmoeten. Hoe oud ben je eigenlijk? Tien. Maar hoe oud ben jij? Ik ben elf. Zo. Wat is je lievelingskleur? Paars. Mijn lievelingskleur is oranje. Dat snap ik. Heb je zin om vandaag twee spelletjes met mij te spelen? Ja. Laat ons beginnen met een quiz. Goed? Ja. Wat is, je, wat is een goed bloedsuikerverhalte voor kinderen? A. Tussen de 1 en 4 millimol per liter. B. Tussen de 2 en 6 millimol per liter. C. Tussen de 4 en 10 millimol per liter. Of D. Tussen de 6 en 12 millimol per liter. Het is C. Tussen de 4 en 10 millimol per liter. Ja. So what we found, uh, we've been doing this for about four years now, taking these robots into hospitals and letting children with diabetes interact with the robots. And what we found was that the robot is really great at being kind of a learning buddy. Uh, we don't want the robot to be a teacher because teachers know everything and that's very, very discouraging for children. Uh, so the robot actually makes mistakes. So when we present the robot, we really say, here's a robot, he's not, you know, he doesn't know everything, uh, he'll fall over now and then, can you help him up? Uh, and together, they'll kind of go on a, a learning exploration. Yeah, they'll learn about diabetes, about how to manage diabetes together. And that seems to be tremendously powerful. Um, we also found that the robot is excellent at being a motivator. So if you're encouraged to stay away from the sugary stuff, if mum and dad, if mum and dad tell you to stay away from the, from, from the biscuits, um, you won't really listen, will you? But if a robot does so, children do tend to listen, and that's really special. Kind of, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of very unexpected outcome that the robot has the power to motivate. And perhaps most importantly is that the robot becomes a friend. Children tend to bond with the robot. They look forward to coming back to the hospital, for example. A return, to the visit, the return visit to the hospital isn't as daunting as it used to be when the robot is there. And as a side effect, we noticed that uh, when you're diagnosed with diabetes, that is really a knock to your confidence. And turns out that when you interact with the robot, um, you suddenly go from being the 
you know, the awkward kid in class needing injections. You go to being the cool kid that actually has a robot friend. And so it's a boost to their confidence. And we think that's incredibly important. Now, we don't only do diabetes. Once in a while, something special comes along. And a while back in the hospital in Milan, uh, a boy was brought in. He was eight, and he had suffered a stroke, which is very rare and uh, very you know, disconcerting at that age. And Ricardo had lost the mobility in his right leg, right arm, and partial mobility in the face. And they couldn't look after him in the pediatrics department, so they brought him to neurology. Uh, and he didn't do well there. He wasn't having a good time. He wasn't engaging with the uh, kind of therapeutic program at all. And the medical staff and his parents had read about the robot in the hospital newsletter. And they asked us if we could bring the robot over just to kind of, you know, brighten up his day a bit. And we decided to actually try to run the therapy through the robot. So the robot uh, basically said, look, um, Try, try and stretch your arm. No, no, not your left arm. Try and stretch your, your right arm just a bit further. Come on, hold it out just a bit longer. And from there, we moved on to the more challenging stuff, doing squats together. And after a while, there was really a bond between Ricardo and the robot. And the robot managed to do in six days what the medical staff hadn't been able to do in six weeks. It managed to get Ricardo back on his legs and discharged from hospital. And as robot scientists, we, we often kind of, we're, we're knee deep into computer code and numbers, but it's human stories like this that make things worthwhile for us. It's the, it's the human face of robotics uh, that we actually really like. Thank you.